coding and then share. Let's see if I can get the sound to work. We don't need much sound, but at least at the end there's a little bit. Yeah, uh, that's okay. There we go, and start. Okay, and uh, I've got this thing here in the way. Right. I hope you can uh, see all that. Yeah, so let's... just got, just got a, a, a cross hatch box in the bottom right hand corner, small at the top. Uh, yeah, that's that. that's where see. I see my video, so. Um... Apart from that, Carson, there's nothing blocking it anywhere. All right, let's go then. Right, so Meteor Scatter. I called it a practical guide, um, but there'll still be some theory to get us started and also some history, which I found quite interesting researching for this. So, um, as time goes on, we'll go more into tools and software and stuff, and uh, hopefully um, at the end, we'll do an actual Meteor Scatter QSO. So we start with a definition, what are we actually talking about? Then uh, some history about Meteor observations, science, and using communication and amateur radio. We'll see how the number of meteor changes, uh, meteors changes over time during the day and um, during the year. Uh, an important aspect of meteor scatter also is the geometry. So it's not um, quite as straightforward as a normal contact where you have the reflection point in the in the middle between the two stations. Um, so that plays a role. And then we look into how to operate Meteor Scatter and then see hopefully um, a complete QSO. So what is a Meteor? Um, start with the meteor meteorid. So basically anything moving in interplanetary space that's not a planet or asteroid, and that's not just a single atom or molecule. So dust of any size or um, smaller little stone size rocks um, moving through the through space. Then we've got a meteorite, which is a meteorite that has made it down to Earth, to the ground. So it went through the atmosphere and didn't lose all material and finally um, crushed into the Earth somewhere. And what we are talking about is the meteor which originally only meant the the light phenomenon that you can see, so the shooting star basically. Um, but more generally, because we're looking at radio, um, either the physical object itself or uh, any phenomenon associated with it. And I think I'm using Meteor all the way through the presentation. So, how did it all start? It started with with visual observations, of course. Um, all through time, uh, humans have looked up at the sky and uh, have seen shooting stars. 
and there's um, records many thousands of years ago of of um, shooting stars. So they were known for a long time, um, but the first scientific interest came in the late 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Um, the first thing was a paper published in 1800 by two German scientists at Göttingen University. Um, Versuche die Entfernung, die Geschwindigkeit und die Bahn der Sternstoppen zu bestimmen. So experiments trying to determine the distance, velocity and orbits of shooting stars. That was published in 1800. Um, then the next big step was in 1833. There was a big outbreak of meteors on the night of 12th and 13th of November. Um, there were up to 7,000 meteors recorded um, in an hour. Um, Obviously, that was a spectacular, um, um, a spectacular uh, um, occurrence. So, Denison Olmsted, who was a professor at Yale, he was woken by his uh, meteors, and he and others noted that the meteors all appeared to come from the Leo con constellation, uh, and Mr. Olmsted he concluded that. Um, the meteors all travel in parallel paths and that the um, apparent, um, so that, that they looks like they come from the Leo constellation was only um, a perspective effect. So they're all coming in parallel onto the earth. And then in the following years, um, there was increase noted on, on other days of the year, for example, in August, the so-called Tears of St. Lawrence, so that's um, named by the um, Festival of St. Lawrence on the 10th of August, and that's the shower that's now called the Perseids. And there was also the Quarantids in January, the Lyrids in April, and what's now called the Delta Aquarids in July that were um, discovered in uh, in these years. And then in 1866, there was another big outbreak of the Leonids in November. And there, um, Giovanni Scaparelli established the connection with um, the Leonids and the comet uh, 55P Temple Tuttle. Um, and there was obviously more visual observations over the years, and they are still important today. But I think that's that's enough um, to start with on the on the visual visual stuff because we're interested in radio. So radio observations started right away as well. So. Uh, in 1925, um, Edward Appleton and Miles Barnett um, in the UK and Gregory Bright and Merle Tuve, uh, they both independently published studies on the reflection of radio waves from ionized layers in the atmosphere. So that was general, the discovery of the ionospheric layers. And Appleton won the Nobel Prize for his research in 1947. But quite soon after, researchers also noted unusual nighttime echoes um, from the ionosphere that they didn't expect because the E layer should normally only have existed during the daytime. Um, for example, Raymond Heising noted the effects seem like great masses of electrons are tossed into the atmosphere rather quickly. Um, 1929, Hantaro Nagaoka 
E-things that meteors swipe away electrons in their path, causing abrupt changes in the refractive index. Um, that should turn out uh, to be false. Actually, they add to the ionization. Um, but he was one of the people who suggested a connection to meteors. And then uh, in 1932, a team of scientists at Bell Laboratories um, published a paper from observations during the 1931 and 1932 Leonids, and they show a correlation between the visual observations and um, radar observations. So this would lead then into more radio meteor science. So in World War II, um, the English radar was occasionally misled by meteors. So the, the long range aircraft radar was operating between uh, seven and 15 meter wavelengths. And the gun laying radar was working on four to five meters. So um, particularly during the V2 rocket raids on London in 1944, they saw many um, echoes um, that they thought would be uh, caused by, by meteors. And James Stewart Hay and G.S. Stewart analyzed the Army radar data. They were working for the Ministry of Supply at the time. And they conclusively show the connection of those echoes with meteors. And Hay also makes sure that the radar equipment becomes available after the war at Georgia Bank. So they start researching into that. And then in 1946, there was a return of a meteor shower called the Draconids at the time, which was first observed in 1933. And um, Lovell, Banville, and Clegg um, measured 4,000 meteors during the peak with visual observations and 10,000 an hour for a few minutes uh, during the maximum using radar. Also, the first um, the first time they measured the velocity of m meteors using radio methods, um, using Doppler effect on on the head echo, so uh, the echo right at the um, point where the the meteor um, enters the ionosphere. Um, and then. E. W. Allen. Um, so, so far that was all radar measurements. So the receiver at the same point or close to the transmitter. And Mr. Allen uh, did the first forward scatter research, and he was using the FM radio stations in the U.S. Um, which were at the time in the 42 to 50 megahertz band. And he also monitored uh, the annual variation in the meteor rate. Now, uh, when was meteor scatter, or as it's normally called, meteor burst communication? um first used so in the early 1950s the possibilities for communications were realized um of course because of the brief nature the communication was limited to digital uh, messages or data um 1952 the canadian military had the first system called janet 
but because computers and memory were large and expensive in the 50s, um, there was not much practical use. In the 60s, there were a few more experiments. And then finally, in the 70s, with the advent of microprocessors and memory chips that were smaller and not as expensive, it became first viable for actual operational use. Um, But of course, there was also uh, satellite communication available at that time. So that was a bit of a competition between the two systems. Um, but quite a few of them were used as backup to satellites. For example, the Alaskan Air Command system had a, a backup system that was using ground stations with um, Yagis on 41 to 46 megahertz. Then there was the Snowtail systems operated since the 70s by the Soil Conservation Service of the US Department of Agriculture. And they were using it to send telemetry from monitoring stations like snowfall and river levels, rainfall lighthouse communication etc they use that uh, to communicate back to uh, main stations so there are two ba base stations in idaho and in utah and they had four, 540 remote data terminals in the western states which all had a yagi a solar panel and batteries and were sending their data back um, to the base stations. Uh, what I found interesting uh, was that it was also used on mobile systems for vehicle tracking, which is still today using GPS, of course, and uh, 4G or whatever. And at the time, there were two uh, companies uh, providing um, vehicle tracking. One was called TransTrack. And they had mobile units, which had a third, 300 watts and a halo antenna for the meteor scatter or the meteor communication and a vertical VIP to receive Loran C for the um, navigation. And the other company was called Pegasus and they used 250 watts transmitters and used a single VIP antenna for meteors and for Laurent C reception as well. And then there was an, another company called the Meteor Communications Corporation that was selling um, meteor burst communication systems as a backup to satellite. So now we're coming into what interests us most, amateur radio. And again, um, that was in there quite early. So in 1946, in January, there was a QST article um, listening to the stars by W6QIT, and he suggested to monitor Doppler whistle, whistles on AM uh, broadcast stations in the 11, 15, and 18 megahertz bands. So, because they had echo moves, um, there will be some Doppler. And if you hear the AM stations weak and there's a strong echo from a meteor, you will have a little uh, whistle effect um, while you've got the reflection from the meteor. Then in November 46 in the QST, uh, W2IXK reports that during the Perseid shower in August, he was hearing fragments of um, two meter sideband signals at the same time that he was uh, hearing those whistles on HF. 
And then in December 46 already, um, there was another Jacobinid outbreak and that was expected to, to come at the time. And there were uh, many six meter contacts made during that um, outbreak. But then it seems to have died down. So there weren't many reports in the following years about meteor scatter. In April 53, then there was another article um, suggesting to use meteor scatter for nighttime context on 20 and 15 meters. So because as we'll see later, uh, the lower the frequency, the longer the echoes. Um, on 20 and 50 meters, there will be so many echoes um, that they start to overlap. So you have a nearly continuous reflection that you can use for contact. Then in April, no, sorry, in October 1953, um, on the 22nd, actually, uh, W4HHK and WUK, after several um, tries for months, um, they complete the first two meter meteor scatter contacts. Um, with the two minute burst being the longest uh, reflection. And for that, they later won the ARRL Merit Award. Then in April 57, there was an article operating, uh, describing operating procedures that are still more or less used like that today. So transmitting for a uh, set period of 15, 30 or 60 seconds and then receiving to um, waiting for the other station um, in a similar um, period. So in alternate periods, you transmit and receive and hope that there's a meteor reflection during that time period. Um, modes used at the time were either single sideband, of course, or high speed um, CW, possibly by the use of uh, tape machines that you could run at different speeds, so record um, fast and play it back slower so you can read it more easily. And there were also um, I guess in the 80s, I couldn't find anything when that was um, modified tape recorders that you could use to slow down um, your recording. And then finally, 1994, DF7KF came out with a little box, the DTR, digital tape recorder, which let you do the same thing record for uh, a time period you could mark the reflections uh, while you were listening to it so you heard the high speed ping or burst and you made a note and then when you played back you could um, find that position on the recording and play it back uh, slow Then 1997, 9A4GL uh, came out with the first version of MSDSP, which does the same thing, but on a computer. Um, do I have the speeds here? No, I think I've got that later. And then finally, in 2001, K1JT came out with version 1.0 of WSJT. Um, with the FSK441 digital mode, um, which brought many, many stations onto Meteor Scatter at the time. And that mode is still used today, even though there, there's, there's other modes as well. OK, 
Okay. So let's see how many meteors are there and how are they distributed over the day and the year. So there's shower meteors, um, usually coming from comets or asteroids orbiting the sun, losing material, debris, and um, therefore, because it's coming from comets or asteroids or, uh, orbiting around the sun, uh, they follow predictable orbits and cross the Earth's orbit once a year on a specific date or possibly even twice if they're oriented um, in the right way. There's a few major meteor showers during the year. This is just a selection of um, the bigger ones. So the next one um, coming up in October, 20th, 21st of October, the Orionids. Um, they have a um, zenithal hourly rate. So the number of um, observations you would have if you looked straight up um, per hour. And they come from um, parent object from Halley's Comet. Um, so as I said, 20th to 21st October. So if you want to try meteor scatter out after this presentation, that's the, the next very good opportunity. And then there's a few more, the Leonids in November. Geminids in December, then the Quadrantids at the beginning of January, and then there's a bit of a lull. You've got the Lyrids in April, uh, Eta Aquarids in May, and the Perseids always uh, around my birthday on the 12th of August. So that's always very welcome. And if you want to look up um, when those showers are, there's several websites. Um, there's the American Meteor Society, where I got this from. There's the International Meteor Organization, which is um, an organization of amateur observers. And then there's also an amateur website. Um, make more miles on vhf.de. They've got a page um, with the upcoming meteor showers for the current month. So they give you also some information about which directions are best at what time, uh, etc. So that's that's quite interesting to to check at the beginning of the month to see what is to be expected um, later in the month. But there's not only those um, shower meteors, there's also sporadic meteors. In fact, there's many more sporadic meteors than shower meteors. They follow seemingly random um, orbits around the sun. The diameter can be any size, really, from microscopic size to really big boulders. And of course, the 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 bigger they are, they uh, the rarer they get. So, um, if you look at some examples there. Um, boulder of one kilo mass, about 40 millimeters diameter. There's about a hundred a day of those. And then if you go a thousand times smaller, one gram, that's, yeah, that's all right. Um, then there's about a hundred thousand per day. And the smaller you get, 
um, the more yet there are. So if you've got mi one microgram, small things, there's about 100 billions a day. And the total mass is estimated to about 40 tons of material entering um, the Earth's atmosphere every day. And there is a diurnal, so daily, and an annual variation. The, the daily variation comes from the movement of the Earth around the Sun. So if you look in this diagram, um, pointer. so here we've got the Sun, uh, obviously not to scale. And here this is the Earth moving this way around the Sun. And you can see at noon, that would be on this um, position on Earth, and the Earth turns uh, um, counterclockwise in this. So we'll have the morning on this side and the evening on, on this side. And so, of course, because the Earth moves in this direction, um, any thing even that's not moving in this way will be hit by the Earth. So meteors will be swept up by the Earth's gravity field. And in the evening, of course, in the evening side of the Earth, anything needs to be faster than the speed of the Earth, which is about 30 kilometers per second um, around. Yeah, so any everything that wants to get into the um, atmosphere needs to be quicker than Earth. So what we have, and this is just an example from Germany, um, in the morning you've got the highest rates, and in the evening you've got the, the lowest rates of meteors. And that changes a bit during the year, but it's more or less um, a sinus shape. Pretty clear because it's caused by the rotation of the Earth. Then there is also an annual variation of meteor rates. Um, and this doesn't have any specific like physical reason. Uh, it's just the way that the interplanetary dust particles are situated around the sun. So uh, the distribution is the same, for example, on the northern as on the on the southern hemisphere. So you see, we've got a lull in. February, March, April, so that's the, the worst month for meteor scatter. There's only the Lyrids in April that um, add to that, but then otherwise there's not so much. And during summer, June, July, August, you've got um, the best conditions. And of course, you also got several meteor showers that add to the sporadic meteors as well. There's a website, um, there's Dunkile Geophysical Observatory in northeastern Finland that's operated by the University of Oulu with in cooperation with Leicester University. Um, and this picture is from last month, from September. That gives you an indication of the activities. So it shows you the current day's number of um, meteor echoes that the radar um, noted. And it's also showing you in the background this dark green, um, the 
long term mean of meteor echoes. So because this was in September, that was still one of the good months. Um, you see, it's almost always um, higher than the long term mean. Um, if we go at the website today, um, come on. where is it? Oh no, that's make my miles on VHF, but. This is the SGO website. At the top, it gives you a direction as well. And here's your Meteor account. So you see it's a bit lower than a month ago, but still relatively high, especially during the, the night time. Okay, so that's worth a look if you're interested. And um it can be affected by geomagnetic disturbances because it's located quite far north. And of course, if you look at shower meteors, they might um, um, they might not be above the horizon. Um, here when they are in Finland or the other way around. So it's just giving you an indication. There's a few other um, websites, but they all give you just a number. So that doesn't tell you too much because you don't have any uh, comparison to the to the mean. Okay. So one sec, just uh, chatting to my scat partner for later. Okay, so let's have a look at the geometry. So when the meteors enter the atmosphere, the kinetic energy is turned into heat. So the surface atoms are vaporized and these then collide with air molecules and are ionized. So that creates a cylindrical trail behind the meteor of free electrons and of course also um, positively charged ions, but they don't add um, much to the reflection. Um, and the electrons then disperse over time slowly, so forming a link, long thin paraboloite with the meteor at its head. So a, a bit like in this diagram here. Okay. The reflection um, on a meteor trail is specular, so basically like in a mirror. So you see um, the light bulb in this case, which is reflected um, in only one point of the mirror. So equating to one point on the on the trail and because of that um, the trail needs to be perpendicular to, to the plane of propagation so the trail of um, the plane of propagation is the plane through the transmitter the receiver and the reception point of course 
uh, it's a straight line from the receiver to the re um, re reflection point and also a straight line to the transmitter. So you've got a plane and then the trail needs to be in a right angle to that plane for um, the re reflection to work. And in many um, sources, many articles, you see mentioned that the transmitter and receiver need to be at the foci of a prolate ellipsoid with a trail tangent to it. Um, that basically is just the same. You can see the transmitter here, the receiver. Um, so this is then the plane of propagation. And this is at right angle to it, meaning it's a tangent to that ellipsoid. But that's not um, the only um, condition, of course. The reflection point needs to be at the at the right height. It needs to be in E layer height, more or less, so 85 to 105 kilometer, depending on the orientation of the meteor trail and the speed of the meteor as well. Um, so that um, influences the height of the reflection point. And of course, because we are not on a flat earth, um, the reflection point also needs to be above the horizon for um, the transmitter as well as the receiver. Um, it's probably not quite um, obvious how that looks uh, from the diagram. At least it took me a while to to understand it. But the, the main takeaway is that not every meteor between transmitter and receiver gives you a burst. So it's fairly rare um, that the trail is in the right orientation and in the right space, um, right location between transmitter and receiver um, for it to work. Okay. If you've got any questions or anything, of course, um, just shout. Okay. Um, so there's a, um, a difference between two types of trails, so to speak, the under dense and the over dense trail. So that depends on the mass of the meteor and therefore the um, electron line density. So the number of electrons per length of trail. You can see that for a line density of uh, less than 10 to the power of 14 electrons per meter, which more or less comes from a meteor of less than one milligram. Um, the trail is under dense, so there's not too many electrons um, and the radio wave can penetrate the trail and excite the individual electrons and those because they're excited by the, your uh, incoming wave um, will re-radiate that wave to the receiver. Um, and then the other type of trail is the overdense trail. Um, there we have a line density greater than about the same number, 10 to the 14th, but this time greater. Um, or mass of the meteor greater than one milligram, and there the reflection is more um, like the reflection of a me metallic uh, cylinder. 
and um, the tr transition between over under dense and over dense is not not sharply delineated. So you can get a typical under dense trail, and then um, a typical over dense. But there's also a transitional trail that we'll see. So what is the power profile? So for the underdense trail, you see there's a steep rise of the signal strength. You look at this diagram from um, a system, Ramses Radio Meteor Survey Extended System by the University of Antwerp. So you've got a uh, signal strength or power, received power that goes almost um, up in a straight line. And then you've got some steep exponential um, fall. Uh, this is one I received. That's probably on the edge of being a uh, an under dense trail, you see it's flattening a little bit at the top there. And um, I don't know if you can hear this. Let's try. That's what that sounds like. Okay. Then we've got a transitional trail. Again, it has a steep rise and then at some point you've got the transition where there's only a, um, a small rise in the signal strength and then again you've got the exponential uh, decay at the end of the reflection. And finally, the overdense trail. Again, you've got the sharp rise, but then it goes into small, um, um, not so steep rise. And um, the signal falls again, and you've got loads of QSB as well. So it starts off like a transitional trail. But then after a short time, wind shear breaks up the trail, um, thereby creating multiple reflection zones. And those multiple zones add up or um, um, subtract depending on, on where they are. So giving you an interference um, pattern and that causes this strong QSB. And this was one I received here. So that's the first 15 seconds, which is the transmit period of the other station. Then the other station went into receive. Obviously, I couldn't receive anything then. And then it continues for another 15 seconds. Um, and it looks like it may have gone on for, for a little bit longer. So that's quite a long uh, reflection, you can imagine. Um, you could, you would be able to finish a, a sideband or a CW five nine nine QSO in forty five seconds easily. Okay, then some maths. And no, I'm not going to go into all the details or anything. And this is the only equation I'm going to show you as well. So don't uh, switch off just yet. Basically, that gives you the received power after a certain time after the initial um, start of the reflection. Uh, what you can see is you get more power at the receiver with more power at the transmitter, of course. And the more gain in your transmit and receive antenna, the better as well. And then you see that the um, signal strength 
is proportional to the third power of the wavelength. So uh, if you double the wavelength, uh, you've got eight times stronger signals. And you can also see the exponential um, decay of the signal. Um, so that's uh, dependent on T, the time, and D is um, diffusion coefficient. So that's just um, how quickly the electrons diffuse in the trail. And you see that's inverse uh, proportional to the square of lambda. So also the higher the wavelength, the longer the reflection is. you only by the square though. So you double the the frequency is, yeah, double the um, the wavelength, half the frequency, you get four times the length of the reflection. There is similar equations for the overdense trail, looks fairly similar. And there is um, another pair of equations for higher frequencies um above for the radar case for about 90 megahertz and for forward scatter uh, between half meter or one and a half meter wavelength that depends on the geometry as well okay hope i hadn't shocked you too much there um, then the last bit of geometry, um, because if you look at this ellipsis, um, it's not very probable that there's a near horizontal trail that would go past um, in this way between transmitter and receiver uh, at the top of this ellipsis. Uh, if it's horizontal, it would more likely be lower, and therefore the meteor would um, get into the um, ionosphere at a different space, or it would be too high, um, so there wouldn't be any reflection at all. The same is true for near vertical trails. So. Um, if the meteor falls straight down, um, there won't be an ellipsis um, where the reflection point is still in the 90 kilometer range and um, above the horizon for transmitter and receiver. And if you look at the statistics, um, there's hotspots above about 10 degrees off the great circle path. So if you look on the right here, that's transmitter and receiver. And the hotspots would be here and here. So you'd beam your antenna about 10 degrees off the great circle path. Uh, depends a bit on the time of day and the path orientation and of course the length of the path. If you are near the maximum of about 2,100 kilometers, um, of course, above the horizon, you only got a little um, piece of sky. So you have to rely on the um, near horizontal trails there for, for those big distances. And depending on the radiant, so the direction of um, where the meteors are coming from, you might have just a single hotspot or one of the two hotspots is stronger than the others. So if you've got a path from east to west and the radiant, um, 
is in the south. So if the meteors, when they come down, so if the rating is the south, so if you look from here, you see the meteors are in the south. Um, um, or look from here, the meteors are in the south, and you see the um, reflection point will actually be in the north, so you'd have the, the northern hotspot hot um, because the, the radiant is at an angle. Okay. And um, all the MS uh, Meteor Scatter software that we use um, displays the, the hotspots for a certain path. Um, so you know which where you need to um, beam your antenna. And of course, um, it's only 10 degrees off the great circle path. So on six meter, for example, it's most likely that you won't have much trade off or much lo uh, smaller uh, beam width than the plus minus 10 degrees anyway. That's only more relevant if you've got a um, a multi Yagi system on on two meters that that um, comes into play even on ten meters uh, on two meters ten degrees off will just be a couple of dB maybe um, of the maximum. So if you beam great circle, you have both hotspots uh, still in your beam width. Um, there's a tool, uh, a program, Virgo, um, which shows you the current showers um, that are active at the time. So that's again from September. And you have to enter your locator so it knows where you are. And then you can see um, the direction the direction is the, the the dot and the elevation as well um, of the showers. So SPE would be the September Perseids. They are circumpolar, so they're always above the horizon. Whereas um, the sextantids, for example, they would only be over the horizon between 347 and 1552. Um, so direction would be northwest. Um, one thing to note is west is on the right hand side because that's meant if you look up at the sky, so it's the other way around. Um, and you see here, if the direction would be here, we would have, say, 40 degrees elevation. So that's the elevation of the radiant. And it suggests to point your antenna 90 degrees, so in right angle to the direction of the radiant. That gives you more or less the best um, reflections. Uh, another tool is um, MS Soft by OH5IY. Unfortunately, that's only a DOS program. Um, so if you want to run it, you need an emulation like DOSBox. Um, it's quite a good tool, but I must admit I have not done too much with it because of the the DOS emulation thing, um, it's a bit of a hassle getting that to work um, and in a window, etc. But there you can enter a date, date and time, and a station. So, for example, I've entered JO50. I used the 8th of October just because I got the date wrong. 
um, and then it from its database it finds the aerated and biscuits, uh, meteor showers, and it calculates an, a path efficiency and a path loss um, for a certain time, and it also tells you which azimuth and elevation you should use at um, a specific time for the for the contact. Okay. Um, any questions so far before we go to the interesting bit? Okay, I'm a bit with that fine. Um, okay, let's go on to operating. So, what do you need hardware wise to get on the air with Meteor Scatter? You need a single sideband capable radio. Um, you need the usual data mode audio interface that you use for RTTY or FT8, etc. Uh, I'd recommend to set the AGC to off or fast if that's possible on the radio, just because we've got those um, strong variations in signal strength and, and very quickly as well. Then I'd say you probably need about 50 watts at least. Uh, the more, the better. I mean, I've done a four meter QSO uh, on Meteor Scatter with 20 watts and uh, um, a Moxon antenna. But of course, that relies also on the, the other station, what they've got. So um, be careful not to overrun your um, linear, it's 50% duty cycle, so 50% transmit, 50% receive, and um, as Meteor Scatter QSO can take some time, it's not instant. Um, for six meter and four meter, you need a dipole at least, um, but of course, it's much, it's much better with uh, some sort of directional antenna, Yagi quad or something like that. And on two meters, you, you need a small Yagi antenna with some gain, um, five elements or more, the more the better, up to a point. Um, and some people do 70 centimeter meteor scatter. I've not tried that. Um, that will only work during showers and you need quite a lot of gain and some power um, to do that as well. So I'd not start with 70 sems. Um, so I'd do six meters to start with. That's how I started. Um, I had a, I was only QRV on, on six and working sporadic E during the summer, but obviously during uh, autumn and winter, there's not so much sporadic E around. So I was trying to find something to do. And that's how I got into, into Meteor Scatter on six. And then um, later for about a year now, I'm also on, on two meters. All right, so that's the hardware. What modes can you use? Of course, single sideband or CW. That works on, on all bands, as you've seen. Um, if, you, if you get an overdense trail with a longer reflection, you can at least exchange part information. Um, again, on six, for example, I was trying to work for you one ITU. And there was no 
pr propagation at all, but um, I think it was one of the G's uh, at uh, an ITU conference. Um, they were on six and were calling constantly um, on CW and listening frequently. Um, and then I heard one CQ just gave my call once, got a 599, sent him the 599, just about got the confirmation and um, then he was gone again. So that was all I heard for about an hour, but I made the QSO. So that works. And also um, on the upper HF bands during contest, I'm sure on 10 meters, there's quite a few um, meteor scatter contests, uh, contacts that, that happen, even if people may not realize it all the time. But then there's um, the digital mode. Um, MSK144 used on all bands. Um, it's ideal for six meters, but on two meters and I guess 70, it will miss a lot of short bursts because it's got a forward error correction. So it's either all or nothing. Um, so if you just get part of the whole uh, two call signs and report, um, it will not show anything. And FSK441 is another digital mode, which is used on 2 and 70. Um, that was the first digital meteor scatter mode um, in WSJT1. So those two are, are the main ones, I would say. Uh, then there's another one mainly for 6 meters, JT6M. That's sometimes used in contests where you have to um, swap a full six letter locator. Um, which MSK, for example, doesn't provide. And then there's a few others. JTMS uh, is a bit quicker than FSK. Um, they all got their plus and minus, but MSK short for MSK144 and FSK short for FSK441 because if you say the numbers everybody gets confused because there's then lots of MSK441 and FSK144 and you don't know what that means so if you just say MSK and FSK everybody will know uh, what's meant and then, of course, there is the high speed CW, but that's um, not really used anymore. Um, just for the speeds. So, FSK441 has uh, 147 characters per second, so that's about 8,800 per minute. Um, with those tape machines, modified tape recorders, they were using about um, 2000 char characters per minute CW. And then with the digital stuff, the DTR and MSDSP on the computer, um, they were using uh, 4000 to 10,000 characters per minute. And if you get, go too high, if you go higher than that, the, the bandwidth um, gets too high. High for a um, sideband channel. Uh, also, to note, all those digital nodes are wide band, about two kilohertz wide. So it's not like FT8 where you sh can share a frequency. There's other ways where you can share the frequency. Um, but yeah, if you transmit, Anybody local will not be able to hear anything, so uh, bear that in mind as well. Okay, so the software, well, all those digital modes, uh, the original WSJT, where well, the latest version is version 10, does the uh, FSK441 and some of the other modes. 
Then you've got WSJTX, which I'm sure most of you will know from FT8. That only has got MSK144 for Meteor Scatter and ISCAT, but that's not really used. And then there is MSHV by LZ2HV, um, which has all Meteor Scatter modes. So this is WSJT10. You've got the reception window there, and you've got the um, spectrum at the bottom, which goes through when you receive through the time. Um, so a bit different than what you're used to uh, from uh, FT8, for example. Then you've got WSJTX. That looks like you know from FT8, only you will not have so many um, stations in one in one period. So there's a QSO there with DK0A. And then this is MSHV there with the QSO in FSK, but we're gonna see how the, the QSO works in a minute. And um, I didn't show you in the other programs, but here you can see uh, I've got the other station in the SM5DWF in JP90 locator. That's um, great circle, 51 degrees, and it gives me a hot B of 40 degrees. So if you want to beam to the, the hotspot, that's 40 degrees. And the other one is always um, symmetrical, so that would be about 11 degrees off. So 62 degrees for hot A, as it's called. So they, they're called hot A and hot B. Okay. There's um, calling frequencies. So 50, 280, 71, 74, and 144, 360 for MSK, and 144, 370 for FSK. And the way you do it, you should always call CQ mentioning a QSY frequency. So you call CQ353, for example, uh, and that means that you send your CQ on your on the calling frequency 360, and everybody who wants to QSO you replies on 353. And if you once you hear a, a station, you also switch transmitting on on 353. So it's different to split operation on HF, where the the X station would always transmit on the same frequency and just listen on a different. Here you call CQ and then uh, switch your transmit frequency also to the to the other frequency. And you can make skets, of course, by email, phone, um, etc. And there's also a chat system by ON4KST that you can log into um, and chat to other users. The operating procedure on six and four meters, you use 15 seconds periods and on two meters and 70 cents, um, 30 second periods. Stations in Western and Central Europe should transmit in second period, so that includes us. Um, so second periods means period starting 15 and 45 seconds past the hour uh, in 15 second periods or 30 seconds pa past the minute, past the full minute on 2 and 70. Uh, sometimes there's also use that if you beam west you call in the first periods and beaming east you call second but that makes the uk always go 
second. Only problem is if you want to have a contact with somebody in Central Europe, then you have to decide on how you want to do it and probably um, move off the calling frequency so that you don't interfere with, with other stations. In MSK144, um, it's basically the same as FT8 or FT4. The reports are between minus 8 and plus 24 dB. And the same QSO is complete when the other station receives your RR73 or uh, triple R's. Of course, you only know that either when you receive the 73 from the other station or um, when it when they tell you on the chat so on the chat it's allowed to give the confirmation that you received the final rogers as they call it but you um, should not tell anything about the qso the qso itself should go over the air of course so um, in this example, there was um, HA2NP calling CQ. I gave him a report. So that's also something um, because it takes longer, these QSOs is a good idea to start with the report rather than sending. Uh, actually, I may have uh, sent my locator as well in this case, and then he came back with a plus zero four report. Obviously didn't hear mine for a while because it sent it a long time. And then I got his um, final Rogers, gave him 73 and quickly got his 73 as well. So the QSO is complete. Um, you have to be a bit careful uh, with if you do use RR73, then um, WSJTX will disable transmit after you sent your first uh, Rogers, which of course you don't want to because that might not be received immediately. Um, in FSK, and the same as for CW, is a bit different. So especially in a SCAT, you start sending a report as soon as partials of the call signs are received. Um, and once you've got both call signs received and a report for you, you can send a R report. And then once you've got both call signs and the confirmation with the R report from the other um, station, you send a string of R's. Um, do not change your report once you've sent it, um, because uh, you don't know one, when the other station receives the report. And the QSO is complete when a string of at least three R's is received. And the report is um, consisting of two digits. The first digit is the length of the burst. If it's a short, uh, smaller than half a second, you give it two. And then the longer it gets, the higher the number, two to five. And the second digit from six to nine is the signal strength. So if it's less than S2 or less than 5 dB, um, you give a six. So two six is the most common report. And uh, the stronger the bursts get, the higher the number. So if you get a five second burst with S5 or more, you give a five nine. And in FSK it looks like that. So this is a sketch with S51AT in MSHV. You see here you've got the um, 
frequency and direction information. And here you've got the messages. You've got the receive a window at the top and then you've got the QSO information in the middle. And here um, you see I received my call sign and I guess that's a 2-6 report. So I can start sending uh, S51TA G0 SYP 2-6. I start sending a report as well. Um, still get some more. Um, you can see there's several uh, receptions at the same period. So um, it does auto decode, but you can also click on the on this thing. It doesn't always auto decode. So sometimes by clicking, you can um, get a little bit more information out and also you can change the parameters um, like the the s limit so that's the the limit under which it will show um, um, or under which it will decode and also the frequency tolerance you can change and that gives you sometimes a little different results um, so still only got uh, my call sign, but not his call sign. I've got an S51 at here. That's good. And then um, with some clicking, I got both call signs and the report. So at this point, I start sending uh, S51 AT G0 SYP R26, R26. So that's TX3 here. And at some point then, a little longer, so that took about 15 minutes, I finally got his R um, AT, so he just sends AT, not S51 AT. So I know um, he's got it, and then if I'm in this uh, chat, I can tell him, yeah, I've got your RRRs, uh, QSO is complete. Right, let's see. Um. Uh, let's go. and see if this works. Move this away. And, okay. No. See if the CPU might like that or not. Looks like it's quite busy. What have we got? Didn't obviously check it with the WebEx running. So that might be a little problem because that's taking 30% CPU. Let's see if it works anyway. So I'm on the calling frequency. You see there's been some reception.
So let's see. Um, hmm. Maybe if I just moved. Right, let's try this. It doesn't look good. So the scan I've got is with DK2EA. He's in JL50. If I can generate the message. And there you can see I already received something, but this is too slow. Um. I'll see if I stop video, does that work better? So, okay, um, it seems to work better. Let's try if I transmit. See if I can give you the sound at least. But it looks like the CPU usage is just too high by, by the WebEx. There we go, got a report. You can see it in the spectrum as well, better than what you heard probably. Another one, didn't decode that. That was a weak one. Should have decoded that normally. So 
So you can see that here. That was a week. First. Maybe if I minimize this. Now oh, that's a good one. See there, it stopped transmitting, even though I was still in the QSO. That's the WSJTX thing. It just does that. Ah, there's our 73. So I can add that to the log. Okay, so let's, and there's another 73, very good. I can send another one, just the one, two. Just to confirm, I've got that. And if you're in the cluster, LN1V in Norway has also spotted me. Okay, um, I think I'll stop sharing now. And back to video. <laughs> All right, so that was that was it.
Thank you very much indeed, Carson. Very interesting. <laughs> interesting indeed. It's a bit over my head in some places, but uh, well done. I really enjoyed it. Uh, can you give her a Carson a round of applause for putting that on for us, please? Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Our guests enjoyed it. Um, something that I'm not into, I must admit, but something very interesting that uh, that can be done with radio. Back off for me, just got to. Uh, any questions for Carsten? Yeah, there's there's already uh, questions by Tristan. Yeah, so the distance uh, was about a thousand kilometers. Not sure exactly, plus minus. And um, how do I know it's not aircraft scatter? Well, aircraft scatter is usually longer because the aircraft doesn't move as quickly. So you can see that. And also on some of the... Um, Doppler shifted as well. Uh, yeah, there wasn't much, uh, or there, there isn't usually, but you've seen the, the very typical um, high steep rise and then the exponential fall of the of the rec reflection mm -hmm. so that's typical of, of meteor scatter i'm just wondering i mean um if you if you claim that say you, you get a contact with holland which is well within aircraft scatter range mm -hmm. how do you if you get your dxcc or something like that i mean how do you does it matter what you know if, it, if it's meteor scatter or not or well, it doesn't really matter for the xcc Context is contact. It could be digital, EME it? or whatever. Yeah, it's right. Okay. Digital, yeah. Yeah. But would you would you sort of go through, with these exchanges? Would you actually sort of in your log demarcate which one is which? If um, you sort of got yeah, it. A... Yeah, you would. Um, I mean, ninety nine percent of MSK QSOs, you would. It would be. Um, um, uh, meet your scatter over distance anyway mm. or it could be yeah in summer of course it could be sporadic you start off with the meteor scatter contact and then suddenly the move rises and you get uh full periods um sporadic e mm. and yeah yeah i've got wolf on the chat on the other computer he's saying best greetings to all hams from bavaria <laughs> nice one yeah. Well, at least, I mean, I'm just going to say, I mean, if you've got a distance of over 600 kilometres, it almost certainly wouldn't be aircraft scatter, would it? You know? Yeah, yeah, uh, correct. So, um, yeah. Just, can, I, can I just ask another question? I don't want to yeah, sure. Take too much time. You, you say you do, you're doing on 70 centimetres. I mean, that... No, uh, I, I, uh, I haven't, no, but, but right. there are people who do it. Right. That must be true scatter, mustn't it? I mean, you can't, you wouldn't be able to get the actual... Uh, a specular reflection that would be a, scat a true scatter mode, wouldn't it? I mean, you'd only get partial of a bit of the energy being reflected back to the, no, to the ground, think, wouldn't you? I think it's the the under dense um, reflections that they're getting. Right, and it is a specular reflection, or is it is it actually yeah. just scatter? No, I think right. it is specular. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just it's thinking. I mean, to know, um, of course. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I mean, it's it's it would be a. I know I'm at the, the Yanks do it on uh, sort of two hundred megahertz. We don't have that allocation here, but um, yeah, I'm surprised. That's the first time I've actually heard it. Uh, people doing it on, on seventy cents, and the fact that you're saying you have to use high power for it for it indicates that it's well above the MUF. Um, yeah, yeah, it's as as you said. As I said, these. The, the formula with the uh, lambda to the power of three and and the the hyper frequency um, formula that at some point in between um, takes effect that's even having lambda to the power of six so it's all very weak and short mm -hmm. so you you have to then they do like skets for for maybe an hour or or even longer for, for, for one of those contacts. So it's not like a quick one, like the six meter. Six meters is really yeah. easy. Yeah. If you yeah. want to start, that's about to go. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Thank you. 
Sure. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, you mentioned that uh, it can be done on, on lower bands. Um, is there a calling frequency for it on, say, 10 meters? Um, not that I'm aware of. Them. No. My I, don't, I don't think it's done at all on 10 meters, really, is it? Uh, I've seen some some uh, people do it in the, on the chat, but it's you don't need to use MSK on 10. You can just do normal sideband, I would think. Even if you do the periods, you just call call the other station in sideband, like oh, whatever, DK2EA, G0SYP, DK2EA, G0SYP for 15 seconds, and then you listen 15 seconds, and you do the same procedure. You don't need a digital, digital mode for that, because the reflections are just long enough. Yeah. I know in certain NetGAF contests, uh... You know, you've made a meter contacts, you're thinking, hang on, the band's closed, but uh, you're making quite a few contacts of about a thousand kilometers length, so probably meteor scattering. Yeah, it can, it can be definitely, especially like if they just come out of noise for a minute yeah. and then they're gone. Yeah, and that's, quite a uh, few times that, yeah. yeah. It's funny, I think I think with 10, I mean, when, when you, start, you start getting below. 50 megs you start getting the the other types of skip coming in and exactly, uh, yeah. and uh, not just sporadic e as well you may get tropo uh, yeah, tropo, uh but but some sort of other iono scatter on the irregularities <laughs> in the ionosphere where yeah yeah or, or it's or the ionosphere is tilting a bit and you get the the lower angle um yeah Any more questions for Carsten? Yeah, Carsten, can I ask a question, please? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, first of all, for inviting the Barry Radio Society into your Stockport uh, meeting. Um, my question is, I'm a CW operator primarily, and sometimes yeah, I hear... Uh, oh, fantastic. Um, sometimes I hear the CW tone spreading on an ordinary QSO. Uh, right. Two meters. What could be the cause of that, possibly? Um, I think that's probably some sort of multi-path um, reflection of somewhere. Um, you see that in, or it could be aircraft scatter. Aircraft scatter is a good candidate, especially around Manchester Airport, um, because there you get Doppler effects from the moving aircraft. Um, should that spread the signal though? Um, not spread. Or but just it might, offset it. It might sound like it if you have the original reflection and then um, the extra reflection close to it. Yeah. A few hertz off, 50 hertz off. Yeah, yeah. Because certainly with Aurora, that's one of the key things in it. The, the the spectrum just spreads. I mean, the with CW, if you listen to an Aurora signal, I don't have much at the moment for that, but. Uh, You'll hear this sort of static crash instead yeah, of the, the tone, the rush like... tone, and that's just because the spectrum is just spread way out. Um, yeah, but yeah, on FT eight, if you if you listen on two meter or six meter FT eight, you often see um, the the main signal if it's a local station, and then you you can see. Um, another signal of the same station sort of slowly changing frequency moving through that I think that's pretty clearly aircraft scatter and I assume that would sound a bit like a spread um, tone on, on CW yeah times I've noticed it is over quite a short path of about um, um, 30 kilometers mm. and our path does actually cross over Manchester Airport so that, that could yeah, explain it. That's a good candidate for it. Um, probably if you check one of those uh, Air Radar 24 whatever they call sites um, 
that might be interesting to correlate that. Um, I've also got, I've not got it installed on this machine. Um, there's a program called Air Scout, I think. Yeah, Air Scout. That's actually for aircraft scatter. So um, it's got a map and it takes the feed from one of those sites um, and maps the aircraft and you put the, your location in and the other station's location. And then it, it sort of shows you the, the overlap in the flight height and the planes that are currently in that, in that area. And yeah. the, the, the VHF guys, um, if, if they do contests, they, they tell you there's a plane in five minutes, come on my frequency and we try a sketch. Yeah, Flight Radar 24 actually gives you the, uh, the, the flight path as well when you click on the aircraft. Mm. Uh, that gives you the, uh, the line of flight. Um, there are, I think there is one of them now that it actually gives you the, uh, the track to its destination as well. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's something like that. It's, it's quite quite good, uh, but yeah. don't have it on this computer. It was ironic, actually, we were in a two-meter net, and uh, I don't know any, any of you know Stockport at all, but we had uh, one of our members in Bredbury, and he couldn't hear uh, the other operator in Edgeley, Stockport, which is like the opposite side, one east, one west of Stockport, until an aircraft went to overland to land at Manchester Airport, yeah. and, uh, and, he, and he could hear him. Just for that, so there's sure a few seconds while it was passing over between the two, uh, the two points. It was just weird, just weird how it, how it worked. Actually, we couldn't believe we couldn't believe it uh, because of the distance isn't that much. But uh, one was at low level uh, with his antenna, so it, uh, it it worked very well. The only thing is they weren't coming over fast enough and close enough to keep keep the net going. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much indeed for that, Carsten. Any more questions before we uh, close the meeting? Yeah, uh, Carsten, it's, uh, it's Pete. Yeah. Well, just wanted to say for the mic, thanks for the very interesting content. Um, I'm not sure if I don't know whether you... I'm just curious what you run. All right. Um, yeah, I have Tennis. a, a five-element, uh, a short five-element... Uh, Yagi on six and huh? about 300 watts out. Um, and Wolf, he's got um, one of those big um, YU1CF do bundles for six and four. I don't know yeah. how many elements that's on six, but I think it's 14 elements altogether. Um, and legal limits in DL 750 watts. Right. Okay. So that was an easy contact. Yeah. But, it, it's, but it's within, not... within my range. I've got a, a five L short Yagi to go up for for six, and, uh, and an, an X one K as well. I think that I could. Uh, yeah, you can you can that. do uh, MS any time of the day. I mean, this is not obviously not as we've seen. It's not the ideal time of day so in the morning i'm sure yeah. we would have had reflection every period okay fine thanks for that well thanks again for the uh, for the invite and really enjoyed the, yeah, the presentation sure. thank you yeah oh at two meters i've got similar i've got um 11 elements and 400 watts yeah it's um yeah the the, the... You notice the uh, the pings are just they're just pings really out there on two meters most of the time. That's they just true, don't yeah. last. I'm just wondering, Gus. I mean, the when you when you do a sked, do you sort of look at um, Virgo and and the position of the radiance for certain showers and things like that? Is it, yeah, if it's in, of... the, in the shower, yeah, um, you can definitely um, make out the difference, but um, if there's only a small shower or like now, there's a few. I've got Virgo on here. Um, there's a couple of showers running uh, at the moment, but nothing much. So, so you're, I, the Orionids or something, maybe? Or something. Yeah, Orionids are a long way out. They're just starting the southern Taurids of Maximil on the 10th. 
Well, be shouldn't they? Yeah, they are um, nighttime shower from here. They're, they're mostly for the southern hemisphere, but um, during the night they they're above the horizon. Right. Just wondering. I'm just just wondering with the because the Geminids is the next really big shower, which is yeah. uh, was it 13th and 14th of December. Yeah. I'm just wondering if maybe an idea is to have a you go on live or something mate i don't know i mean uh it just seems like this that that would be the next big opportunity i mean in fact we've missed the perseids because that was in august but i mean if you get the peak of the geminids you get a zenith hourly rate of 100 plus yeah. meteors and the shower isn't too late usually the best time you know like you were explaining even with the showers are usually sort of around dawn but the the good thing about the the geminids is that, is that they tend to peak uh, the best time to hear them is around is around midnight, uh, you know, which is very early for most meteor showers. Yeah. So may, maybe that's something that I don't know. Um, you could do a live thing. Yeah, yeah. Because... Yeah, I'll be interested in that. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I was thinking as well. I don't to take too much time, but the, uh, the the thing that people can do just listen. <laughs> Is uh, tuned to is it, uh, I think it's one four three point oh five oh. Yeah. For the graph meteor yeah. radar, it's just a constant carrier at about. Uh, it's a satellite radar, so it's it's really high power, but it's in southwest, southern France somewhere. So you beam southwest, yeah. and it will pick up even a crummy antenna, will pick up the sort of pings and the zings, from the, uh, the meteor scatter, uh, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, and again, it gets just a but, constant current. Yeah, t six meter, if you've got a dipole or anything like that, or a vertical would, would work as well. Um, just yeah. go to 50, 280 in the morning and, or during the shower, definitely, there will be signals. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Evan, what frequency was that again, please? Uh, if I remember correctly, it's 143.050 yeah. megahertz. That's the actual carrier. Um so if you if you switch the thing on to CW, that should be that should be dead on the middle. If it's sideband, you want to be offset uh, by a thousand hertz or something. All right, thank you. And is that just a straight carrier, or does it sort of encode at all? No, no, no it's just a straight carrier. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions for Carl before we I close? I thank you all for joining us. It's been a pleasure to see some, some new faces. Join our... our uh, please look out for our website for the next ones.